As we grow up, we are always told to make as many mistakes as we can, because it's from those mistakes we learn and get it right the next time afterward. But what we were never told was some mistakes are irrevocable and have devastating effects. Such is the case of Hisashi Ouchi, who made one such mistake that altered the course of his life and his future. This is the story of the radioactive man. Hisashi Ouchi, who was born in Japan in 1965, started his career in the nuclear energy field at a pivotal moment for his nation. With scarce natural resources and a high reliance on imported energy, Japan had turned to nuclear power generation, constructing the country's first commercial nuclear power plant only four years before his birth. The power plant location in Tokaimura was ideal due to the abundant land space, and it led to a whole campus of nuclear reactors, research institutes, fuel enrichment, and disposal facilities. Eventually, one-third of the city's total population was dependent on the fast-expanding nuclear industry in the Ibaraki prefecture northeast of Tokyo. The incident that made Hisashi become known as the radioactive man was not the first of its kind in this town. On March 11, 1997, an explosion occurred after an experimental batch of solidified nuclear waste caught fire at the Power Reactor and Nuclear Fuel Development Corporation PNC, radioactive waste bitimmunization facility. Before a government cover-up was started to hide negligence, dozens of people were radioactively irradiated. Two short years later, the significance of that incident was overshadowed. The plant converted uranium hexafluoride into enriched uranium for nuclear energy purposes. Usually, this was accomplished using a methodical, multi-step process that involved combining a number of components in a precise order. In 1999, officials began experimenting to see if skipping some of those steps could make the process faster, but it caused them to miss a September 28th deadline for generating fuel. So, at around 10 a.m. on September 30th, with an obscene lack of safety measures but a deadline to meet, the Japan Nuclear Fuel Conversion Company, JCO, told Ouchi and two other workers to mix a new batch of fuel. So Hisashi Ouchi, his 29-year-old colleague Masato Shinohara, and their 54-year-old supervisor, Yutaka Yokokawa, tried a shortcut. But the three men were untrained in the process and mixed their materials by hand. They used their hands to load 35 pounds of enriched uranium into steel buckets instead of using mechanical pumps to combine it with nitric acid in a specified vessel. They mistakenly dumped seven times the amount of uranium into an incorrect tank. The uranium reached critical mass relatively quickly. Gamma rays invaded the room as Ouchi stood directly over the vessel, and a blue flash revealed that a nuclear chain reaction had taken place and was emitting deadly radiation. Ouchi's unparalleled nightmare had only just begun as the plant and nearby communities were being evacuated. Kept in a special radiation ward to protect him from hospital-borne pathogens, Hisashi Ouchi leaked fluids and cried for his mother. He frequently went into cardiac arrest and had to be brought back to life at the insistence of his family. His only escape would be a final cardiac arrest some 83 long days later. Hisashi Ouchi and his co-workers were transported to the National Institute of Radiological Sciences in Chiba as the plant was evacuated. They were all in close proximity to the fuel. Thus, they were all immediately exposed to the radiation, albeit to varying degrees. Exposure to more than seven sieverts of radiation is deemed deadly. The only member of the team to survive was the supervisor, Yutaka Yokokawa, who had been exposed to three. Masato Shinohara was exposed to 10 sieverts, whereas Hisashi Ouchi, who stood directly over the steel bucket, was exposed to 17 sieverts. The radiation dose in a critical accident at a nuclear power station may be considerably worse than in a catastrophic disaster. Through a burst of neutrons and gamma rays, these criticality events have the ability to deliver a significant amount of radiation in a little period of time. That one burst, if you're close enough, you can sustain more than a deadly dose of radiation in seconds. High doses of radiation damage the body, rendering it unable to generate new cells, such that the bone marrow, for example, ceases creating the red blood cells that carry oxygen and the white blood cells that fight infection. Your fate is predetermined, even though there will be a delay if you get a high enough dose of ionizing radiation that will damage cells to the extent that your organs will not function. Ouchi's exposure was the most radiation that any human being had ever suffered. When Ouchi, a handsome, powerfully built, 
former high school rugby player who had a wife and young son arrived at the hospital. Though he was in immediate pain, he could barely breathe. He didn't yet look like a victim of intense radiation exposure. His face was slightly red and swollen, and his eyes were bloodshot, but he didn't have any blisters or burns though he complained of pain in his ears and hand. He was first taken to the National Institute of Radiological Sciences in Chiba, just east of Tokyo where the doctor who examined him even thought that it might be possible to save his life. But within a day, Ouchi's condition got worse. He began to require oxygen and his abdomen swelled. It was determined that their lymphatic blood count had dropped to almost zero. Most dire was his lack of white blood cells and the absence of an immune response. His symptoms included nausea, dehydration, and diarrhea. Doctors placed him in a special ward to prevent infection and assess the damage to his internal organs. Things continued downhill as he arrived at the University of Tokyo Hospital after being transferred there three days later. Doctors tried various measures including revolutionary stem cell procedures in a desperate effort to save his life. Six days after the accident, a specialist who looked at images of the chromosomes in Ouchi's bone marrow cells saw only scattered black dots, indicating that they were broken into pieces. Ouchi's body wouldn't be able to generate new cells. A week after the accident, Ouchi received a peripheral blood stem cell transplant with his sister volunteering as a donor. Ouchi's first week in intensive care involved countless skin grafts and blood transfusions. Cell transplant specialist Hisamura Hirai next suggested a revolutionary approach that had never been tried on radiation victims before, stem cell transplants. These rapidly restored Ouchi's ability to generate new blood. This approach was much faster than bone marrow transplants, especially with his sister donating her own stem cells. Disturbingly, the method appeared to work before he returned to his state of near death. He began to complain of thirst, and when the medical tape was removed from his chest, his skin started coming off with it. He began developing blisters. Tests showed that the radiation had killed the chromosomes that normally would enable his skin to regenerate, so that his epidermis, the outer layer that protected his body, gradually vanished. With his DNA erased and brain damage rising every time he died, Ouchi's fate had long been sealed. It was only a merciful cardiac arrest due to multi-organ failure on December 21, 1999 that rescued him from the torment. Japan's Prime Minister at the time, Keizo Obuchi, released a statement expressing his sympathies to the workers' families and vowed to improve nuclear safety procedures. Regrettably, there was the immediate aftermath of the Tokaimura nuclear disaster to cope with, which saw 310,000 villagers within six miles of the Tokai plant forced to stay indoors for 24 hours. Over the next 10 days, 10,000 people were screened for radiation, with more than 600 persons suffering low levels. But none suffered as much as Hisashi Ouchi and his colleague Masato Shinohara. Shinohara spent seven months fighting for his life. He too had received blood stem cell transplants. In his case, physicians extracted them from the umbilical cord of a newborn. Tragically, neither that method nor skin grafts, blood transfusions, or cancer therapies had worked. He died of lung and liver failure on April 27, 2000. According to the inquiry conducted by the Japanese government, the accident's primary causes included insufficient regulatory control, a lack of proper safety culture, and insufficient personnel training and certification. Six officials from the company that operated the plant were charged with professional negligence and breaking nuclear safety legislation. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, a court fined the corporation and at least one of the officials in 2003, in addition to giving them suspended prison sentences. The two deceased workers' boss, Yokokawa, was treated for three months before being discharged. He had had a slight radiation illness and survived, but he faced criminal charges of negligence in October 2000. Japan Nuclear Fuel Conversion Company, JCO, meanwhile, would pay $121 million to satisfy 6,875 compensation claims from impacted locals. The nuclear power station in Tokai continued to run under a different business for more than a decade until it shut down automatically following the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. It has not operated since. Hisashi's story demonstrates how a mistake may be so fatal, costing you not just your life, but also the lives of others, with long-term consequences for future generations. Think about this the next time you want to do something totally negligent. 